So what's really going on in the rental market? If the real estate market drops, will rents drop? And what should you do if you're a renter and you can't pay your rent? The expert is here and I'll ask her those questions and more starting right after the music. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. She's back. Let's get started. Who are you and what do you do? Hello, um, everybody. I'm Rachel and uh, I own a company called Landlord Rescue and I'm a property manager and I help landlords uh, do all kinds of things, including uh, get rid of problem tenants if necessary. Um, And so that's what I do, essentially. And so if I had, and thank you for being here, Rachel, you were uh, on the show back in March of 2018, which was show number 187. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That was before we were doing this by video. This is show number 294. So thanks for agreeing on short notice to fire up the Zoom camera and, and return. So you're a property manager. You just said that. And so as I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, If I own a house or a condo and I want to rent it out, I can hire you and you'll look after everything. You'll uh, collect the rent uh, from the tenants. You'll call the plumber when the water leaks, everything. And then I obviously I pay you a fee for that. So is that essentially what you do? Absolutely. That's exactly what I do. That's exactly what I do. Okay. And the reason I wanted to have you on is because you're out there in the real world. So you are actually... Um, you know, dealing with landlords and tenants every day, even though we're in the middle of this, uh, uh, you know, this, this COVID thing. So what are you seeing out there? Give me the lay of the land. What's happening in the rental market right now? So essentially for me, um, the rental market is completely halted. So nobody's seeing anything. I have a couple empty units. Nobody's going there to see it. Uh, it's like completely slow, uh, dead in fact. So nobody's actually um, going out and looking for a new place at this point in time. I mean, I expect that's going to change, but at this point in time, nothing's happening um, that I can that I can tell because. It, People are just are not going anywhere. They're not going to the grocery store. They're certainly not like, hey, Joe, let's go find a new place to live. <laughs> and so are you seeing rent deferrals then? So we're we're recording this. It's, you know, 930 in the morning, Wednesday, April the 15th, 2020. So the lockdown started in March. People were starting to get laid off in March. So I'm assuming that people whose rent was due either April the 1st or April the 15th were having trouble. Are you seeing rent deferrals? Absolutely. So we're seeing a few, not so many as we thought. Um, Like we had, I think like three or four out of maybe uh, like about a hundred or so. Um, a lot of that is because of the way that we run our portfolio has always been very conventional and safe. So we're not in like, we don't generally rent to, to um, like, they tend to be like higher end condos in the 2000 plus mark. And, you know, like you don't get a lot of people in the service industry renting, for example, those kinds of condos. Uh, not all like always, but um, as, so as a general rule, it tends to be professionals, and those people have not so much been impacted, except for um, we have one gentleman who um, who is in the film industry, and so he was laid off like very early on, and so and his rent is like considerable. It's like uh, th- I think around three thousand a month. So he's like, I'm laid off. I'm working on my line of credit. And he like actually sent a very nice email. I mean, the thing, it should be a template. So here's some advice. So this is how you handle uh, the whole a rent deferral thing if you have to uh, as advice to tenants. Essentially, he sent an email. He's like, I'm in the film industry. I've been your tenant for four years. I've never paid the rent late. Uh, he had, he's like, I had one NSF check, but it was replaced in days. Um, And like a very, very nice letter saying, okay, um, I'm working on my line of credit. Um, He's like, you can have the rent for March, but um, 
I would like to send you more checks for half the rent uh, going forward until I'm back at work and not pay. So he paid March in full, but he's not going to pay April. So he wants like uh, roughly half his rent till this is over. And the landlord um, was like, yeah, okay. And then she said to me, yeah, but you need to take your management fee out. So I was like, okay, I don't care. <laughs> you know, you know, what is it? Like, I mean, you know, I care, but not that much. So I was just like, okay, that's fine. And uh, so we made the deal with the guy, but his approach was very rational very nice and uh, he's a very decent guy he's been a good tenant for years and the reason i say that is because i, I was also approached for a deferral from another tenant and so she essentially called me like screaming saying she's like shouting at me on the phone from the get-go she like this is her thing she's like i'm uh <laughs> god it's terrible I heard landlords can get deferrals and I'm not paying my rent because I don't have any rent money and I haven't had any rent and all this stuff. And I was like, well, we don't know that the landlord can get a deferral, right? Because a lot of the times landlords on secondary properties are not getting deferrals. It depends who their lender is. So she made all these assumptions that the landlord was going to be able to defer things. And she's like, I don't want to pay. And so I said to her, I said, like, you don't know that there's going to be a deferral. Don't assume there's a deferral. Like, what can you do? And she's like, I'm not paying anything. It's a rent strike and forget you. And so then she sent, like, she sent an email to the landlord saying that I was a vile cow. A vile cow. There you a go. A vile cow. Because I wouldn't, like, agree to immediately defer her rent. And so this situation has, like, completely deteriorated. And so this was like a couple, actually happened a couple days before uh, March, <laughs> March 1. And so I was like, uh, so I sent her a nice email, like professional on March 1. And I was like, listen, you know, I know we talked, we kind of got off on the wrong foot. So like, I'm trying to be generous about the whole thing. I was like, um, you know, I understand you can't pay your rent. Can you do a little bit? And she's like, I can't pay anything. And then she emailed the owner again. And she's like, uh, you know, tell this woman not to talk to me. She's terrible. She's a cow. And like, she, she keeps going. And she's digging this hole for herself. And so, like, if you look at the difference between the two approaches, I mean, a lot of, like, what's going to happen to you in the future, um, like, the courts are closed, right? There's no... Um, uh, there's no landlord and tenant board at, in operation at this point. So that doesn't mean that the rent isn't owed. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be owed in the future. It means like right now the landlord cannot do anything about your non-rent payment, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to accumulate and so on. It, it just means that I can't like make an application to the landlord and tenant board to evict you at this moment and currently any evictions that were scheduled are cancelled and also um like um like they're not there like there was like a bunch of uh hearings scheduled and all of those were cancelled so if you had a hearing it was cancelled and so really the only thing the landlord and tenant board is dealing with at this point as far as i know is um is uh you know like things like lockouts okay so having said that that doesn't mean that you know like it's like you your credit card debt you don't pay your credit card it doesn't go away i mean it just waits till the next month so so i think that you know the talk like people kind of misunderstood the whole concept of like um you know, you're, you can't be evicted right now. It does not mean that you do not have to pay your rent or that it's not accumulated. And here's the, the other thing is, um, eventually that might catch up with you. So back again to your interpersonal skills. So shouting at your landlord that you can't evict me right now is just going to mean that he's going to evict you later, which may or may not be what you want, right? 
So if you're like, want to stay, continue staying in the place where you are and like, so this is, this is how I would handle it is you have to like, kind of try your best to make everybody happy. So people are having significant financial difficulties right now. You can't really pay everything. It happens. So you kind of want to triage things, right? So like triage is a medical term and we're in a pandemic. So this is perfect. So you want to like cut out the things that you don't, that aren't absolute necessities. People are going to be getting, you can get maybe $2,000 a month, um, you know, from the CERB or whatever that, and that is actually landed in people's accounts. So what you want to do is you want to triage that money. You want to save some for groceries. You want to save some for, you know, your absolute necessities. I, I heard that people have like put their car insurance on hold. They're not driving to work. You're not going anywhere. You're out of work. Put, put your car insurance on hold. Defer some payments if you can. Some credit card companies have reduced their interest. Like a lot, all of these things are floating around. Now, when you sometimes call these people, then you discover, well, you know, uh, this is a worthless program. Like for instance, like there was talk about, uh, in my case, like the small business uh, loan program that they had, but you need 50,000 in payroll. So I don't have 50,000 in payroll because I, it's not, a lot of the people that work for me are contractors. So, I mean, I don't have 50,000 in payroll. Um, so I'm not eligible. So a lot of the programs that you get are going to be like that. And some of them you need to show hardship. And, and the, the, so, and then to top that off, like it's not enough that we have a pandemic. Um, we'll call them like the tenant activists, right? Have set out and then they went around and they told everybody that it should be a rent strike this month because they know the government's not enforcing. So they're like, let's have a rent strike, you know, in this middle of the pandemic. And it's like, again, I don't, I think they really do a disservice because, you know, we're all struggling. Um, and I'll give some examples of that a little bit later. Um, like for instance, I have one, one tenant who's like actually got a couple jobs and uh, this is another deferral I did and I waived the management fee in that. So he's got two jobs and one of them was as an Uber driver. So obviously he's like, I'm not doing Uber anymore. Um, I need a break. And, um, and then, uh, but his landlord, you know, is not like a, a, you know, multinational corporation. She's a lady who has a condo. She bought it to live in it herself and whatever. It didn't work out. So she rents it out and she lives at home with her parents. She's not a rich lady, but she's a dental hygienist. So guess what? She's laid off. So the tenant comes to us for rent relief and he's like, what can you do? And, um, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know, like the, the landlord's laid off. So she doesn't have money either. So it's like, okay, well, what do you do in that situation? So then I call the landlord and I'm like, what can you do? And she's like, well, you know, um, I'm laid off, so I can't do much. And so what we ended up doing is like a small rent reduction. It was only a couple hundred bucks, but I waived my management fee, which is like about a hundred bucks. And then uh, the, um, the landlord kicked in another, uh, you know, hundred and something bucks. And so the guy got a bit of a break, which, you know, is not perfect. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, it's not even like a deferral. It's just straight forgiveness. And then I've had other landlords call me and say like, are my tenants okay? Uh, do we need to do anything? Do I need to know anything? And I was like, you know what? Um, Hold on, because we don't know. Because the, the, the pandemic is not affecting everybody. So some people are still at work. So yeah, sure, if, uh, you know, if you work as a waitress and your work is shut down, yeah, you don't have any income. But um, if you work as, you know, for instance, if you work in property management, nothing's changed. I mean, you still have to show up and go to work every day. I mean, you might remote work more. You might not go into the office if you have a bigger office. Uh, but, you know, for a lot of people, they're still getting paid. They're still working. They're still, 
uh, you know, doing whatever. And so for that, those people, like, everything is fine. So, you know, like, I think there's a lot of fear out there. And that kind of concerns me. I see it because of my kind of unique position, uh, you know, where, you know, I really haven't stopped working. Um, you know, things are a bit slower. Certainly you don't see people in the office very often, but, you know, occasionally you do. Um, well, everybody's terrified. And really that's the story, right? Like the pandemic really has everybody kind of, frightened and scared and we don't nobody really knows what's going on and so I'm uh, you know I'd like to say I'm a realist like I can see that yeah you know we should be um, concerned obviously but we shouldn't like jump to the worst conclusions having said that if the shutdown continues there's going to be some serious ramifications so now like month one essentially of the shutdown, like we started like in March, right? So, you know, April one, there's been some challenges. Um, it depends how long it lasts. So if this la so I, I think people's ability to pay the rent and to, you know, pay for things in general is gonna deteriorate, obviously, the longer the shutdown lasts. And like $2,000 a month in, you know, serve income doesn't go very far when your average condo rent is over 2000. And so that's really the issue. So what are we doing? Like if you're in a small town and your rent's 800 bucks, 2000 bucks a month is, you know, fine. That's fine. But what happens later on? And so, and because of like kind of my, ex my exposure to different industries, what I'm seeing out there, Okay, so I'm in a hotel. We talked about that because my basement flooded, okay, and um, where I live. And uh, so I'm in a hotel. I've been in a hotel since March. So all the hotels around here, except for the one I'm in, are closed. And this one's about at 25% occupancy. So other hotels, they just closed. Um, you know, uh, they're at like 3%. Like nobody's traveling. And the reason I mention hotels is because, you know, I'm in one. And so I get to see it up front. <laughs> I don't have a breakfast. Like all the good things about being in a hotel, Doug, forget about it. It's all over. It's completely like I don't have a pool. I don't have a spa. I don't have house cleaning. They come like now they're like, okay, well, come change your sheets once a week. Um I mean, I'm not complaining because I'm just grateful I have a place that's not outside at this point because all the hotels have shut down. Um, uh, there's no gym. Um, they put up like a giant plexiglass. So a lot of the parts of like that you might consider good about being in a hotel have just disappeared. And um, there's a kitchenette here. So I have to go shopping every couple days. So I go to the grocery store. And of course, I'm going to work every day. Um, and so I, I get to see a lot of things and like some of our, the, the clients that we see are things like car companies, right? Um, well, apparently our repossessions are up already. I mean, you might not be surprised to hear that, but apparently repos are up already on cars. And then where I work, my workplace is like, um, it's like a mall. It's like, we're on the second floor of a mall. Okay. And this, like, typically, you can't park in the front of that mall, okay? And as a, you know, kind of person who works there, you're required to park in the back. Well, you know, there have been days where there are two cars in the parking lot, in the entire parking lot of, like, this, you know, typically very active mall where you can't park. Like, it's hard to find parking sometimes. You're like, where do I park? Um... There's like, like you can just, there's nobody there. Like you could just like run, I don't want to say like run naked through the halls, but like, it's like, there's nobody there. And so this is really the thing. And these are all like self-employed people. And because we're still working, essentially, um, like 
the um, <laughs> people drop in and see us. And so you see like people are like, you see people like wearing double gloves, uh, winter jackets, mask, sunglasses, hat right and you're and they're like i haven't been out of my house in three weeks i've only had to come here because this is a in that case it was like a, to commission a document so you need to do that in person and people are just like fearful and so i don't think that's going to disappear essentially the minute they're like oh yeah covid is gone see you later like everybody's going to rent like these people are not going to run out and buy stuff and so i see essentially a lot of the restaurants are disappearing are they're just going to disappear and i'm going to talk a little bit about commercial rents here because people i don't think understand commercial rents very well and what you need to know about commercial rents is that they're very high so like people complain about two thousand dollars a month in uh for a condo and really, um, they don't understand that like a restaurant would be like for a small space, like a small space would be 5,000 a month, right? And go up to like 12, $20,000 per month. And so essentially, like a lot of these businesses with zero income are not gonna be able to recover unless their landlord just forgives their rent because even after the pandemic is over i people are not just going to run out and they've said that it takes like 30 days to create a new habit so how many one of the things i have heard is people who like ate out a lot and were out all the time and very active are like oh my god look at my credit card bill it's so empty right they might be working from home but they're not going out and so i think that a lot of these habits of cooking staying at home all that kind of stuff that home-based stuff certainly if this goes on for two or three months i think that we're going to see that continue as a new normal and i think that so if that continues as a new normal uh we're looking at severe problems because like all the businesses that say eke through like these commercial businesses who may exist with a rent deferral or rent forgiveness they're going to open up thinking like okay it's everything is back to normal it won't be back to normal like the how long will it take for uh you know people's habits to change and a lot of people be just like hey uh i'm stuck at home i've been eating you know home food and i lost 20 pounds you know like this is the kind of thing that i think that people are not really thinking like on the other side and so and, and in my business I mean, Airbnb, let's talk about Airbnb and the hotel industry for a sec because, um, okay, so Airbnb has been a force in, um, in, uh, in the world and people have complained a lot about it in the, um, what I would say is the, hold on, I got to decline a phone call. Well, and the, the Air, Airbnb is an interesting uh, topic, of course, because depending on what numbers you look at, there's something like, I don't know, 20,000 Airbnb units or 10,000 Airbnb units, whatever it is in, in the GTA, or maybe that's Ontario or Canada. I don't know the, the numbers. I, I don't have precise numbers, but if nobody's traveling, then nobody's booking an Airbnb because often that's something you do either you know for work purposes or vacation purposes. And if I'm a guy who owns a couple of condos and I've put them on Airbnb and now I can't rent them out, but I still have my, my mortgage coming in. And as you said, the mortgage deferrals that the banks are doing are for your principal residence. They're not for real estate investors who have five condos. So I've still got my mortgage payments. I've got no tenants. I suspect a lot of those people are either going to put them up for sale right away or they're going to try to put them into the, the long-term rental pool. Is that what you potentially see happening on the Airbnb side? Well, okay, so Airbnb, uh, the numbers I saw was 20,000 just for the downtown core. Wow. Like downtown condo, like 
Toronto proper. There's a lot more than people think. And, um, you know, we've had, like, uh, I want to say, like, uh, I, I want to remember the exact time, like, about a year ago. Like, I don't do Airbnb. I, I evict people for doing Airbnb <laughs> because I had so many issues. Like, I mean, like, um, like, I mean, this guy, you know, like, like these are million dollar condos downtown, right? Like very nice places. So you have a guy, he's Airbnb out his condo. He has a guest, the guest dog gets out in the hall, shits in the hall. <laughs> so security calls me and they're like, what's going on with this dog from your unit? And I'm like, what are you even talking about? Like my tenant doesn't have a dog. And then I find out like, oh, he's been Airbnb being the unit. And of course the condo doesn't like that. And it's just a giant kerfuffle. And like, oh my God. So like, this is the kind of thing that you see. And then there was a bunch of damages in that unit. And so, and then, you, so I deal with mostly the disruption. So, but having said that, I had a tenant of mine who used to have a condo that he rented with me. He's like, oh, I'm in this new business now, Rachel. And I'm like, oh, what is it? And he's like, well, if you have any reasonably priced condos, I'm going to, uh, I'm uh, doing Airbnb and condos. So this guy rents condos to Airbnb. And he's like, I'm going to be responsible. So God knows what's even happening to those people. And, and so like, there's like this whole weird Airbnb industry and it's like, well, okay. Having said that, so, okay. So now those places have no income. I, I was saying to you like regular hotels have like 3% occupancy. And if anything, the, 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 the people who are renting Airbnb right now are like frontline workers who are self isolating from their family. So they're like, you know, virus traps, essentially. I don't know how to say that any better. Anyway, so apparently it's a big problem with the Airbnb. Their income has dropped to zero. And so what we've seen is people are putting their Airbnbs, like kind of like trying to do like furnished long term. Okay. And here's the thing. I mean, in, uh, and I say this to people all the time, in Toronto, can you know, Canada in general. Furnished units are only so-so. There's a market for them, but it's small. Long-term tenants have their own furniture. Like that's just the way we roll. And and so, you know, you're not gonna get you're gonna have a hard time. And trying to get a tenant in this environment where nobody's going anywhere or doing anything is even more difficult. And so what you're going to have is a bunch, like, and you can't sell them because essentially my understanding right now is that sales are also uh, halted essentially. So the main issues are now we have essentially, you know, 20,000 of these rental units. And those are just the ones listed on Airbnb. Now there's a lot of people that also list short-term rentals on other platforms like Kijiji and Craigslist and don't have insurance. They, they don't want to do. And then there's a bunch of other people that are off the platform. So these are just, uh, you know, people who are using Airbnb at this point. Right. Um, so you flood the rental market with that. And then you have a bunch of unemployed people. And so what we, the story, the narrative from the city of Toronto has been rents are going up, rents are going up, rents are going up. And I'm telling you, if there's like 10% or 12% or 25% unemployment, rents are not going up. Rents are going down. And like, I've seen this, you know, in the past, there's a market out there for condos um, in the livable range. And the problem is if, <laughs> if people can't afford it, they're not going to rent it. It's not a question of like, oh, uh, you know, it's, let's say, for example, a car, you know, you're like, oh, I need a car. Okay. But do you need a beater car? Or do you need a brand new Porsche? Like, that's really it, right? And it's like, the lug condo market in my mind um essentially started out as a luxury market right you had 
purpose-built rental buildings, and then you had the luxury market, and that's it. And condos were luxury. Now, these are bare bones places. I mean, they're talking about not putting ovens in them. Like, oh, tenants don't need parking or ovens or this or that. They're making them smaller and smaller. Mostly to appeal to the Airbnb space. So all of that is now, I think, essentially dead and dead for quite a while. So, you know, people have quit their jobs to run Airbnb and do all this kind of stuff. All of that is like toast. So there's no answer on what's going to happen to that. I, I see like some of those condos making their way onto the for sale market, but who's buying right now? Like if we have like an extended period of, of, of like closure and significant unemployment and, you know, like kind of the, the aftershocks of this pandemic, which is be like people are staying home more then who's you know and and immigration is down as mr you know as ben was saying then then who's occupying all these like micro units nobody that's who so um and these are going to depress the prices and people just do not understand how price sensitive the market is because um people have said to me like oh the rents are going to be three thousand dollars in you know x years and they go up and i'm telling you those properties do not move like you can rent your you can try and rent your condo for three thousand a month and that's kind of what made pop you know airbnb so popular because people were trying to invest but there was so much resistance because people's salaries have not gone up and you know if you're a buyer of a place, you can roll in your equity from your previous place, right? And so your price, you know, your payments might stay the same or go up a little bit. But if you're a renter, you have to pay that out of your cash every month. So you don't have that flexibility and you don't have that access to credit that the homeowner have. You don't have a HELOC. You don't have any of these things. So essentially, your salary is the cap for what you can afford. And for a lot of these, uh, like a lot of condos, like you, it's so price sensitive. Like, like, let's say, for example, you would have a new condo and you like, OK, I'll give you an example. Actually, I rented in a new condo um, uh, just a little while back. Uh, so we have this new condo. Um, there's a parking, so we want a little bit more than the price. So, like the price for other units in that building was like nineteen, like two thousand a month essentially, right? Which is pretty much what I've said for a long time is almost the cap on what you can, you know, get almost for like a one bedroom condo. I mean, so but because it had a parking. I added like a hundred dollars. So it was like twenty one ninety five or something like this. And you know, like it just sat and not one person came to see it until I split up the parking. I split off the parking. I'm like, okay, everybody's going in this range. And then the, the, uh, the owner was like, oh, well, my friend was with a realtor and they rented in multiple offers for 1985. And I'm like, yeah, because you hit that threshold. Now everybody wants it. So I did the same. I'm like, we got to split off the parking. The price is whatever. And the parking is extra. And then let's go. And then, so we ended up doing 1990 and she got 1990 and that's it. That's the ceiling. And the reason it's a ceiling is because there's 40 units that are identical in the same building and nobody's going to be like, I'm going to pay you more. And they're all like, okay so okay i had a window in the kitchen or the lights slightly changed like nobody cares because you're not buying it you're renting it. yeah and, and if so you're making three thousand dollars a month you can't be spending three thousand dollars a month on on rent so well and that, and that's all fantastic information this was the easiest interview i ever had to do because you just you know covered all the points so that was that was fantastic so what I'm hearing from you then is if I'm a tenant and I'm having trouble with my rent, it would be much better to treat my landlord or my property manager as a human being 
in your example, hey, look, here's my situation. I've been a good tenant. This is the industry I'm in. Things are tough. Can you give me a break? And there's a good chance the landlord will give you a break. Whereas if you take the opposite approach and say, well, all landlords are rich. I'm not paying you anything. Then I guess I'm going to get evicted when, when this all shakes out. So you have written a blog post and I'll put the, the link up to it on your website, landlordrescue.ca. The, uh, the blog uh, post was titled Tenant Guide, No Rent Negotiating. And you actually go through a whole step-by-step -step guide for a tenant who needs to um, you know, talk to the landlord about their, their situation, open a dialogue and you know, be nice to them, work something out. So final question for you, and we're, we're pretty much out of time, but you're, you don't think things are going to get better tomorrow. You think things are going to continue to erode, and that kind of makes sense. If people aren't working, that would be the, the logical choice. So if I'm a tenant, now's the time to be talking to my landlord. And if I'm a landlord, now's the time to be reasonable, because if rents are going to go down and if it's going to be harder to find tenants, I'm probably, I probably should be keeping my good tenants. Would that be a, an accurate summary of where we're at? Absolutely. I think commercial or residential, uh, good tenants are going to be uh, back in resurgence. And there's been like this, I'm going to call it a trend that I found very disturbing in the last five, I would say like 10 years going downwards, where we didn't appreciate good tenants. It was just like, well, you know, essentially because they didn't cover the entire cost of the house, they became almost like I would say a custodian, right? Or like a, a super of the place where, you know, they paid part of, part of the expenses for the place. And it was just like because the real business uh, of real estate was no longer in collecting the rents. It's in buying and trading the real estate itself. So originally when I started this business, you would, the business was you would collect the rent and that's how you made money. But in this environment, that's not how you make money. It's not by collecting the rent. The rent money is made buying and selling. So the importance of the good tenant in that scenario is that they annoy you when you want to sell your property and get your profit. Okay. And that's like a really sad commentary on the business. And, but going forward, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily think, I think that the resurgence and appreciation for good tenants that to be honest, I've always had, because I, you know, started this business, like I've been in the business like 25 years, so I know how important it is, um, is going to be there. But what I also know is that there's a lot of pressure, like, I, I, one of the questions that I, I got earlier uh, from, and I think it's kind of important, is this. The question that the, somebody asked was, how do I renegotiate my rent downwards? Okay. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because it's really important. Um, and generally this is just a rule across the board. So if you have a supplier for widgets, they're not really going to give you a break on the price. It's going to be very difficult. And if they do it, they're going to do it with great resentment. And, and so the issue that I would say is that you're going to have to move. So that's, that's going to be, that's how you get your price decrease. And I want to talk about the other thing that a lot of people don't realize about condos, houses, um, you know, and things general when they're vacant in the city of Toronto or anywhere. The landlord has to pay, um, you know, usually more than what the rent is in this environment to keep that place going month after month. So especially if you're in a condo building and they can see other listings, let's say uh, there's some desperation out there. And, I, and I've seen this in action myself and you can see it in action when there's like 40, um, 40 units for rent in a new condo like people get so desperate they just lower the rent like every day they're just like oh i'm just gonna keep lowering the rent and they have to because you're in a competition like in a fierce competition with 
essentially identical units. And the only differentiation you can make really, and we're all advertising on the same platforms, is to lower the rent because everything else is the same. So that's going to attract your tenants and there's just no way around it. So going forward, if there's some like higher vacancy, right? And these, you know, let's say even uh, 10,000 of these 20,000 Airbnbs hit the rental market, there's going to be a significant, because there's going to be a significant downward pressure on the market and there's going to be deals. And the reason for that is because people are just going to be like desperate, right? Because they've been carrying the empty place for let's say three months and nobody's coming to see it because the virus. Um, and so there's going to be like some real desperation for somebody who has a job and don't forget there's going to be like significant unemployment and people who don't have jobs and traditionally these are not people that landlords would ever consider without even like saying like okay i need a year's rent prepaid i mean okay but that market's going to disappear too because we saw that prepaid rent mostly in the uh, uh new immigrant or you know uh foreign you know like international student market right where people were like throwing around a year's rent so having said that if you have this downward pressure so what you're going to see is you live in building abc towers and you're going to see units for rent in abc towers for less than you're paying and so what you do is you just rent another unit in abc towers if you happen to like abc towers or you look across the street at DEF towers, which is again virtually identical to ABC towers, but across the street, and uh, that's it. I mean, essentially, I mean, people have talked about how you know the you know it's a commodity, right? Like housing has become a commodity, and now it's also a commodity. Nothing's changed. It's a commodity, and it it remains a commodity on the way down, right? And it's like. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I rent condos. I like condos. I, I think they're, you know, a decent housing solution in some cases. But I mean, if you've seen one condo, essentially, you've seen a lot of condos because they're <laughs> very similar. And so this is going to work against. So then the only thing that you care about is the, the price point. So this is this is it. And, you know, um, yeah, so, you're, you're right. If if it's a commodity, then the price matters. I don't care what gas station I buy my gas at. It's all basically the same stuff. It's coming from the same yeah. thing. So, so what you're saying then is as a tenant, I can talk to my landlord and say, look, my lease is up at the end of the summer. I'd like you to drop it from 2200 bucks to 1900 bucks. And if the landlord says, yeah, no way, I'm not going to do it, then it's okay. See you later. I'll just move down the hall or move down the street because there's a whole bunch of them and that's that's likely what's going to happen. And most of the landlords will because they will not be, you know, in touch with the new reality. Uh because a lot of them, I'm sorry to say, have not experienced a high vacancy situation. They are not familiar with um, you know, what it takes to survive and fill a vacancy in these kind of situations. Yeah, they just assume that there'll be a new tenant there tomorrow, so it doesn't really matter. What they don't realize is if the unit is vacant for three months before they can find a new one, they got a problem. This reminds me exactly of, of an employee who doesn't think they're getting paid enough, and they say to the boss, hey, I want a raise, and the boss says, nope, that's, you know, I've always paid you that much, that's what I'm going to pay you. If as an employee I want a raise, I got to go find a new job, and it's probably going to end up being the same way for the, the tenants as well. So th those are some very interesting perspectives on what's going to happen, and I think it's good news if you're a tenant, I guess, maybe not so good news as a landlord, but and it's going to take us all a while to, to adjust to the new realities because that's kind of where we're at, right? We're all used to what, the way it was, not the way it's, it's going to be. So. Rachel, I very much appreciate you coming on today from your uh, sequestered in your hotel room and everything. Thank you very much for doing this. Your website is landlordrescue.ca and your Twitter handle is Landlord Rescue. So anybody on Twitter should be, should be following you there. Um, any final comments you want to make? Any other uh, you know, ways for people to reach you? Is that a, 
is that a good way to end it? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell everybody, uh, you know, to remember, uh, you know, um, not to be so fearful, not to be, yeah, we might have to stay two meters away, but it's okay to say hi still, <laughs> you know, and like, like just kind of like, I don't know. I just feel like the entire, uh, like my experience of the world is that people are very fearful. And when people are fearful, they're not really thinking. And that's a problem. And I think that's a bigger problem than, you know, the virus itself. So how we treat each other, how we go ahead in this environment, our level of fear is all a big deal. And just to remember, you know, not to be so fearful, we'll all get through this. And at least some of us will be okay. If you're 80 plus, maybe not, but you know, oh well. Yeah, but no, and I, I totally agree with you. And I think you're right. Uh, we're all humans. And if we can remember that the person on the other side is also a human, my landlord's a human, my tenant's a human, then uh, like you said at the start, people are going to respond a lot more more favorably to that. I think that's uh, an excellent way to end it. Rachel, thanks very much for being here. Have a great day, Doug, and stay out of trouble. <laughs> well, I can't promise everything. Thank you very much. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. Okay, well, that was, uh, that was great. You didn't have to ask any questions. No, this... I should do this for a living. I could just sit here and say, oh, off you go, Rachel, and I'll be, uh, I'll be back in half an hour. So thank you very much for doing that. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, no, it's all good. It's all good.